Hi guys, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, a true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 19, Frankie Gonzalez. On June 1st, 2020, Laura Villayon Sanchez called police in Waco, Texas, reporting that her two-year-old son, Frankie Gonzalez, had disappeared while she and her three young children visited a local park. Police and various other agencies mobilized a massive search involving land, water, and air, but no sign of Frankie could be found. The next morning, Laura led police to her little boy's body, which she had hidden in a dumpster located on the property of a church. This is a story of bad behavior, chronic CPS involvement, drug addiction, and very poor decisions. This is the story of Frankie Gonzalez. My sources for today's episode were KRIS 6 News, Big Country Homepage, KSAT, 25 ABC, CBSN Dallas-Fort Worth, KWTX News 10, KXXV, The Waco Tribune Herald, Fox 4 News, Facebook, The Missing Souls Justice for Frankie Gonzalez Facebook Group, Fox 44 News, and the Park Lake Drive Baptist Church Facebook page. Before I get into Frankie's story, if you're a fan of the show, please take a moment to like, rate, review, and share the show on your favorite podcast platform and on social media. Every five-star review gets me closer to reaching new listeners, and so does every share or retweet or reblog. You can find me on Twitter at stlcpod and stlcblog, and on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and Pinterest, I'm at Suffer the Little Children Pod and Suffer the Little Children Blog. No spaces or dashes. On YouTube, I'm at C slash Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Your support means the world to me. Now let's talk about Frankie Isaiah Villayon Gonzalez a beautiful two-year-old boy with big brown eyes and an utterly disarming smile. This case is very much still ongoing. In fact, the results of Frankie's autopsy have yet to be returned, which means there will likely be further criminal charges coming. Frankie lived in Waco, Texas, with his mother, 35-year-old Laura Jane Villayon Sanchez, and his father, 28-year-old Lorenzo Gonzalez, and two sisters, ages six months and three years. At 1.53 p.m. on Monday, June 1st, Laura called 911 to report two-year-old Frankie missing. She said that while she and her three children were at Cameron Park, they entered the restroom near the splash pad in Pecan Bottoms, which is one of the park's three giant playgrounds. She told police she briefly turned away, and when she turned back, Frankie was gone. Police in Waco immediately launched a search for the little boy, who was described via the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children as two feet six inches tall, unknown weight, with black hair and brown eyes. He was last seen wearing a red and gray Mickey Mouse shirt, gray Mickey Mouse pants, and black and white Nike shoes. To give you a little scope, Cameron Park is enormous, spanning 416 acres inside the city of Waco. In addition to miles and miles of wooded areas, the park has three separate playgrounds, a splash pad, water misters, pavilions, picnic tables, walking trails, a baseball field, two cliffs, scenic overlooks, open fields, an outdoor classroom, fountains, a 100-step zigzagging staircase, a clubhouse, and an actual zoo, not to mention access to two local rivers. Needless to say, searching for a two-year-old boy amidst all of that would be a highly daunting task. Waco Police Department officers combed the area of the playground, and as the search expanded outward, they were joined by other agencies including the McLennan County Sheriff's Office, Texas Game Wardens, Texas Department of Public Safety, City of Waco Cameron Park Zoo staff, City of Waco Park Rangers, and Department of Family Protective Services. At around 3 p.m., authorities closed the park entirely. Rescue crews from the Waco Fire Department searched the nearby Brazos River while police spread out throughout the park on foot. The Gatesville unit of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice brought in bloodhounds to assist in the search. A helicopter and drones were used to search by air. Although there was no official physical description of a suspect or a vehicle, an Amber Alert was issued around 7.30 p.m. Police believed Frankie to be in grave or immediate danger. After several hours of search and rescue efforts, the search for Frankie was suspended at around 9 p.m. to resume Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. 
Waco Police Department Public Information Officer Garen Bynum spoke with the press that evening. I'm Officer Garen Bynum with Waco Police Department. Yeah, so we, we received a call, 911 call, at 1.53 this afternoon in reference to a missing child. Um, the child that uh, is still missing is uh, Frankie Gonzalez. Frankie is two years old. Uh, he was last seen wearing a gray Mickey Mouse shirt uh, with pants that also have Mickey Mouse on them. Uh, he had black and white Nike shoes on, uh, and he's, like I said, a two-year-old Hispanic male. So uh, we have literally done uh, everything we could do today. As far as the search, we've had multiple uh, agencies out here assisting us with the search. Uh, we've had even uh, personnel from Parks and Rec. We've had personnel from the zoo, from the Cameron Park Zoo out here trying to assist the best way that they could. Uh, and we have suspended the search for the night. Our plan is to pick back up in the morning to continue the search uh, where we're going to bring in uh, more resources and uh, just see what we can do um, first thing in the morning, uh, like I said, at 8 o'clock. So right now, we're keeping the park closed down. Um, so I'm going to ask that people don't come down here as of now. Um, if there becomes a time that we want um, community assistance in this, we're definitely going to push that out. So uh, that has not been uh, communicated as of yet. Uh, and it's something that's going to have to be a coordinated effort. So it's something we're going to have to put together and build uh, before we uh, ask people to respond out here. Uh, but it, it's a possibility. i uh, not going to rule out the possibility of that. So tomorrow is going to be a new day. And, uh, and once again, we're just going to exhaust every avenue that we can tomorrow. Okay. Right now we have no leads towards anything. We don't know if it was an abduction. We don't know, uh, where, we don't know where he is. We, we don't have anything to indicate um, anything. So we have uh, obviously looked into every lead uh, that we could uh, thus far. Um, and that's why we've had people in the water. There's been nothing that said he went to the water, but we're just too close to not to not look into that. So that's why we're we're continuing all of those efforts. We don't have a suspect. We don't have any kind of information, uh, vehicle information, anything like that. Uh, and we don't even know uh, if we're necessarily looking for a suspect at this point. Even though we're suspending for the night, we're not suspending the search. We're going to continue on in the morning, and we know. Uh, once again, that the first 24 hours is absolutely uh, critical to finding a child like that. So, yeah, we're going to continue on. Tomorrow, I know that we're going to, we have plans to continue our search um, even into lunchtime uh, and past that. So uh, we're looking at the 24-hour mark um, at a minimum. While searching took place on Monday and late into Monday evening, detectives conducted interviews with members of Frankie's family attempting to follow every possible lead. Frankie's mother, Laura, told detectives that Frankie had spent the weekend with her adult son in nearby Colleen, but other members of the family told police that was not true. Waco residents continued their own civilian searches overnight, some on foot, some using their own boats to search the water, even in the dark. Many people posted Facebook Live videos documenting their search efforts. The next morning would bring about revelations that would crack the case wide open, as well as the hearts of everyone who had been following the story. Early on the morning of June 2nd, Officer Bynum spoke with reporters again to announce the plans for the day's searching. So, like we had said last night, we're back here. It's 8 o'clock this morning. Um, there's been a lot of questions that we've gotten as far as um, how people can help. All right, so let me address that real quick before we move forward with anything else. Um, we have had multiple search parties out here, private search parties out here last night uh, that we're looking. Um, right now, what we want to do is we want to just keep people out of the area as much as we can. And here's the reason for that, okay? We have multiple resources coming in today. We have uh, uh, multiple canine units that are coming in today that do specific article search type things. So we're trying to keep the ground from being contaminated as much as possible. If it comes to a point where we're going to start asking citizens for help, I assure you, you guys will be the first ones to know. Um, so for right now, let's keep... Uh, this area still closed and still clear of, uh, of too many people coming in to contaminate the area. As far as search efforts for today, what we're going to do is we'll continue on. This is still a search and rescue mission, uh, according to the commander that's leading the search um, as of today. Okay, um, The resources that we're going to use today are going to be the very, very similar, if not the exact same, that we used yesterday. We already have our SWAT guys out here. I know the McLennan County Sheriff's Office already has a boat in the water. Uh, we'll also have Texas Parks and Wildlife. Uh, the game wardens will be out here as well, uh, continuing the efforts. Uh, and I assume we'll have, uh, once again, uh, helicopters, drones, and that uh, type of thing. 
Uh, we've brought in the police department's uh, UTV or side-by-side -side unit to help uh, get through some of the trails and stuff. We had several of those type, um, those type vehicles out here yesterday as well. Um, so that's the plan for today, okay? Um, as far as a, a time frame, we're gonna keep going till we know uh, something different. That, that's our, that's our uh, honest plan for the day. Uh, we're gonna continue this to be a search and rescue effort uh, until we know something different. We have a couple of different uh, clothing articles that have been found kind of throughout town. One of them was on uh, near MLK and Lakeshore. It was a Mickey Mouse shirt. Uh, investigators were made aware of that last night. The investigators that we have don't believe that that shirt is related. Uh, and as far as the tennis shoes uh, that were found, I believe there was a pair of black and white Nike tennis shoes found at 18th and Hearing at about 6.30 this morning. Um, I haven't heard back from investigators on whether or not they believe those are connected or not, uh, but uh, our, our investigators were definitely made aware of, of both articles of clothing. Camera Park here in this part of it at least is going to remain closed the, until we open it back up. So once again, we're just asking people to avoid the area. Still don't have anything else. I know our investigators, and I can tell you this, as far as our efforts go, um, our investigators were interviewing family members and things like that up until 1230 last night. Um, so to, to think that we're, you know, we just called it a night at nine o'clock, that's just uh, simply not true. We, we had people um, actively trying to work a case and trying to follow and find any lead that they could up until 1230 last night, and they're gonna be right back here uh, in the morning. So um, that's part of it. We had to get rest to be able to come and, and have a full fresh day today. Uh, as far as the time frame, I know some people were concerned that we stopped at night. Uh, some of it was due to rest. Some of it was giving our investigators time to start looking into leads um, or you know any type of following that they that they might have had. So, uh, but we are absolutely exhausting every resource that we have. Uh, we are looking into uh, different things as far as social media. We're looking into every avenue that we have right now, uh, just to try to find anything. Uh, we're just trying to basically find anything that leads us one direction or the other right now. So um, as far as uh, everything goes out here, this is still going to be a search and rescue. Um, so we're going to treat it as such, uh, like I said, until we're told otherwise. Not long after that, the Texas Department of Public Safety discontinued the Amber Alert for Frankie after Waco police announced on Tuesday morning that they had discovered the body of a small child in a dumpster. The trash container was located behind the Park Lake Drive Baptist Church which is less than three miles from the park where Frankie was first reported missing. Officer Bynum once again spoke with the press, this time revealing the devastating news. So just to give an update, uh, we obviously moved our location right now. We're at 26th and Park Lake, uh, set up in the church parking lot here. Um, this is what we have so far, all right? At, uh, at a location behind us around 27th and Alice, uh, investigators learned throughout uh, the investigation that uh, there was uh, potentially a body here uh, in a dumpster, okay? We have located uh, a, a, the body of a small child that we believe to be um, the, the missing juvenile. Uh, we haven't been able to confirm that at this time, uh, and autopsy will have to uh, actually do the confirmation on that. But uh, like I said, right now we do we did find a, the body of a small child that we believe was the, uh, the missing juvenile, okay? As far as any kind of search efforts uh, back at Cameron Park, we've opened up Cameron Park at this time. Uh, and we've suspended any kind of search efforts there. So that's where we're at right now. Um, this is gonna be a very busy area. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of uh, traffic coming throughout. So uh, I ask that people please respect our, um, our attempt to do a, uh, a thorough investigation of this, try to avoid the area. We do have a lot of officers here to try to help keep the, the scene secure. Uh, so I just ask that uh, citizens avoid this area and try to uh, respect that for us. But we're we're going to wait for uh, a, an official autopsy to actually uh, give us the cause of death or anything. So, so I know investigators once again are, are continuing to investigate or continuing to ask questions uh, and interview uh, family members and things of that nature. But right now, I don't have any suspect information to give you. Okay. It was definitely a possibility uh, that he was taken from Cameron Park, uh, but we're exploring all avenues, whether or not he was actually taken from Cameron Park or uh, or anything else. So uh, that's part of the, the reason for the Amber Alert. Um, if you looked at the Amber Alert, it didn't have any suspect information that was put out on it. And the reason why is because we didn't have any suspect information to put out on it. Uh, it was just one more attempt of us to be able to locate this, uh, this child, Frankie. What led police to the dumpster? Well, on Tuesday morning, another family member contacted the Waco police and told them that overnight, Laura had confessed. 
Authorities quickly confronted Laura, who admitted her son was no longer alive and that she had placed his body in a dumpster somewhere around North 27th Street and Park Lake Drive. Officers accompanied Laura to the area, and she led them to the dumpster outside the Park Lake Drive Baptist Church, located near Park Lake Drive and Alice Avenue. Around 8 a.m., inside the dumpster, investigators located the tiny body of a little boy wrapped in several trash bags. Authorities remained in the Park Lake Drive area throughout the day on Tuesday, including SWAT officers assisting with crowd control. A large crowd amassed in the church parking lot as crime scene technicians worked in the neighborhood and police officers comforted bystanders. Rumors swirled, both in Waco and online, that Laura had hanged herself, but these stories were quickly squashed. Laura was taken into custody by Waco police that morning. Justice of the Peace Diane Hensley declared Frankie's death on Tuesday, June 2nd. The arrest affidavit issued for Laura Sanchez states that she was questioned throughout the day on Monday and even into the night. After being Mirandized on the morning of June 2nd, Laura finally confessed to police that she had lied to them several times, including her statement about Frankie spending the weekend with her adult son in Killeen. She told them Frankie was in her sole care and custody when he died on approximately May 28th. She also confessed she kept Frankie's body in her house until about May 30th, when she disposed of her toddler son's body in a dumpster like yesterday's trash. On Monday, June 1st, likely setting up her alibi, Laura had posted a photo on Facebook from inside her vehicle along with the caption, On my way to the park with my three little ones. The only child visible in the car was her three-year-old daughter, who had a pacifier in her mouth and a decidedly worried look on her little face. Police now believed Frankie had been dead for approximately three days at that point and had already been disposed of prior to the family's trip to the park. Laura's car was impounded. After Laura was arrested on suspicion of first-degree felony injury to a child with intent to cause serious bodily harm, in addition to a parole violation, she was booked into the McLennan County Jail. On June 3rd, her bond was set at $500,000. She was soon placed into protective custody within the adjacent Jack Harwell Detention Center facility, secluded in a cell by herself for her protection due to the nature of the case and the high profile of the story. Frankie's sisters were taken into state custody and placed into foster care. A spokesperson for the Department of Family and Protective Services said they were cooperating in a joint investigation with law enforcement regarding Frankie's death. It would soon turn out that this was far from the first time Laura had been in trouble with both the law and CPS. As I mentioned, in addition to her charge in relation to Frankie's death, Laura was also charged with a parole violation which stemmed from her prior criminal history. In 2012, she was convicted of burglary of a habitation after breaking into a Waco home to steal a Nintendo Wii game system and other items. She was sentenced to deferred probation for six years. The deferred probation was revoked in 2015, and she was sentenced at that time to 10 years of probation, which was subsequently revoked in 2017, replaced with a sentence of six years in prison. Laura was paroled in May of 2019. Her parole was scheduled to end in September of 2022. Court records indicate that in January of 2020, Laura was booked into McLennan County Jail for unpaid traffic fines, and she currently owes the county over $500. Records also show that her parole officer attempted to contact her twice in the past few months, in March and May, without success. Due to her incarceration, Frankie's father, Lorenzo Gonzalez, had custody of the couple's two older children. It is unclear who fathered her six-month-old daughter, although there are some indications that Laura and Lorenzo were a couple as recently as last September, based on some of their Facebook photos. Some sources indicated that Frankie and his older sister were with Laura on visitation when Frankie's fatal injury occurred, although it later became clear that Lorenzo and Laura were actually living together. A makeshift memorial composed of photos, balloons, and stuffed animals sprang up around the dumpster in the church parking lot where Frankie's body was discovered. The church, which asked the city to remove the dumpster, has publicly said that the dumpster will never be used again out of respect to Frankie. On Wednesday, June 3rd, the church posted the following on its Facebook page. We've heard some criticism of our decision to have the dumpster that Frankie Gonzalez was found in removed from our property. We understand people's grief toward Frankie's senseless death, and we are touched by the makeshift memorial of balloons and candles left by the community. We at Park Lake Drive Baptist Church believe Frankie's life was precious and made in the image of God. A dumpster does not reflect our value of his life. This is why we have made plans to set up something more permanent at the site of his finding. 
Phipps Memorial of Waco has donated a granite memorial, and we are in discussion with a local artist to paint a culturally appropriate mural on the side of our garage. We want to thank the city of Waco for being so considerate in moving the dumpster with sensitivity to those mourning Frankie's death and our neighbors who have been traumatized by such a horrible act that took place right outside their homes. On the same day, KWTX News 10 reporter Drake Lawson spoke with a local artist, Scuba Valley Trevino, who created a gorgeous memorial painting of Frankie in just two and a half hours using only spray paint on a board. A photo of the painting is included in the Facebook photo album for this episode. How y'all doing, Facebook world? I'm Scuba Valley. Just a regular old neighborhood scumbag. I'm just here. I'm here with the community, and we're still out here at Cameron Park with uh, to support Frankie, you know? This is uh, the beautiful portrait that Scuba Valley spray painted. How long did you say it took you? It took me about two and a half hours, maybe. It was one of those things where you wake up in the morning and you just feel like you needed to do something, you know? Especially with our community and everything, being in crazy times, like the protests going on, the, you got riots, you got the, you know, a lot of bad stuff going on right now. This, this was just like... It was too much, man. We needed some beauty in the world, and I figured if I could do something real nice, hopefully within two hours, then I'm going to go ahead and try it. Because I know the vigil was at night, so I just had to hurry up and do that, you know what I mean? And it made me feel special, and I'm sure it'll make the family feel special. And to be honest, I would really like the father to keep this if he wants, you know, to take this and do as he pleases. Cause I made this for him and his family, you know, in memory. So after it's all said and done and everybody gets a chance to kind of release their emotions a little bit, it's all his to take. There's no words, man. There really is no words to describe or even to make anybody feel some kind of comfort when something like this happens. That's right. That's all we can do is just try. Just keep pushing, keep trying. Because life does get better. And there's always somebody there to talk to you. There's always somebody there. You look to your left, look to your right, get on Facebook, get on social media. Somebody's going to be there to help you out. It doesn't rain forever. The rain has to stop sometimes. And it just gives you time, man. Time heals all wounds. And sometimes we just got to just gotta give life time. It really has impacted us in a big way. A big way. It actually brought the community together. As bad as that, you know, situation was, it, it shows that Waco is just more than the silos. It's more than, you know, the Alico, the Twin Bridges and whatnot. It's, it's community. Also on June 3rd, Frankie's older siblings and two of his older cousins spoke to the media. Jonathan Medina. Um, I'm his big cousin. Uh, Eli Garza. I'm also his big cousin. Michael Casio. I'm his big brother. Anessa Medina, I'm his big cousin. He meant the world. Like, ain't no two year old deserve this. And, like, I'm his big brother, so he meant everything to me, you know? Like, I feel lost without him. And, like, for everybody that was helping, I appreciate it. Staying out, like, overnight and stuff and just searching. I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. He, he was never sad. He was, he was, he was always happy. He, he's happy. Like, he will always laugh. Anything we would do, he's laughing. He would fall, get up, laugh. He's always just there for us. Like, he, he wasn't nobody invisible. He's a little kid. He was he a human. A he made a big impact on all of us. Like, he he was happy. Like, he was just always there. Like, he, he, he was happy with everybody. Like, he would come up to one of us and be like, he me, he would be like, you. hey, old guy. Like, <laughs> He would just come up and up to you and just try to get to know you. You know what I'm saying? My name. You know what I'm saying? Paco. Paco. Like, is it? Just really everything. Everything. Like, now it's it just, he's missing. And it's, it's going to impact the family because it's like he's gone now. And it's going to be weird not seeing him anymore or seeing him around the house running, playing. It just, it, it's going to hurt, but he will want us to push through, so we're going to do it for him. It's Frankie's world now. It means a lot. I thank everybody who was out there with us all night looking and helping. Thank everybody. It's, it really it really touched us all. 
I mean, I mean, it means a lot. Like for whoever went and searched, it means a lot. And like for the people that had all the hate comments, everything that doesn't mean nothing. Like only the family knows the truth. And whoever was out there, we thank y'all. I didn't, I didn't want to believe it. Like I, I thought I was, I thought I was getting like a, a dream call. I, I didn't picture it. It didn't, it didn't make no sense to me. I didn't know what to feel. I wanna, I want a statue to be made because Waco showed love. Like. There was no riots here, it was peace. And everywhere else there's riots and stuff, but he brought peace to wake up. So so me personally, I feel like it's only right. There's a statue that's, that that should be made here. If Bubba, if Bubba's is gonna pay for the funeral, I mean, the red, leftover money that goes to that too, I, I mean, they could go to the statue then too, for however much money they make. We don't, we don't, we don't want the money to come to us, we want it to build a statue for Frankie. We don't want the, the, the money for us. We want to donate it for something big for Frankie because that's how much he meant to us. When I when I got there, to the park. when I got to the park, I went up to her and I asked her, where was Frankie at? And she told me she didn't know. And I said, what you mean you don't know? And she told me she didn't know, but she didn't look, she didn't, have, she didn't, she didn't even want to look in my eyes. So I knew Frankie wasn't there. Like, Cause I got the call saying he was kidnapped. So I ran, I ran like we, we rushed up there. She lied to me. She lied to all of us. We, we was all inside the water and I looking. We could have, we could have, we could have died in that water. Like anything could have happened to us. We could have got bit by a snake or anything. We could have, and she had us out there like for what? That, that was our family member. Like why would our own family member betray us and like tell us lies give us different lies after lies and then come to find out what really happened i just i want to thank everybody that that came out and helped and searched and for the candle lighting and they just showed love so i appreciate everybody that that had every that had a part to do with this yeah. frankie said frankie. you now this is it's all frankie's for frankie world. Frankie's, world. frankie's world he's waco's baby uh, he made an imprint on everybody yeah, not a lot of people knew him but they love him now. Everybody from Waco, they know Frankie now. He's he's in their minds. And he's looking down at all of us right now, wanting us to push through. And live through us, and all we got to do is now be strong. Candlelight vigils were organized on Tuesday night, both in Cameron Park and in the Park Lake Baptist Church parking lot. At the church vigil, more than 200 people gathered in the parking lot, lighting candles and shedding tears for Frankie. The church's senior pastor, Amos Humphreys, as well as other members of the church, prayed together, asking the crowd to turn to God. Pastor Humphreys said, When many of you heard Frankie was missing, you were concerned. Many of you ran to the park to look. You shared posts on social media to rally the community, and the community rallied together, and I think that is what is so shocking. We were all looking for a different outcome or something that was positive, and that didn't happen. But I want to assure you the fact that we are here together, the fact that we rallied together, bonded together over this, that is positive. Members of Frankie's family attended the church memorial wearing t-shirts bearing Frankie's image. Frankie's adult brother, Michael Ocasio, also spoke at the church vigil. I appreciate everybody for coming, for, for helping, for staying out and like being out there for, like for me, for my little brother, you know. I don't know what to feel, it's my little brother, but I mean justice is going to be served. At the Cameron Park vigil, hundreds of balloons were released into the sky in memory of the slain boy with the big brown eyes. Just listen to the excitement of the crowd at the moment the balloons were released. The balloon release was a beautiful gesture and a heartwarming display of a community coming together to remember Frankie. At the risk of being a major stick in the mud, though, I need to pause here and hop up on my soapbox for just a minute to give a little PSA about balloon releases. Although it's a lovely idea, there are a multitude of less deadly and environmentally damaging ways to memorialize a child. I'm only mentioning it in the hopes that when the next tragic death inevitably occurs, those wishing to memorialize the departed will choose an equally celebratory but much less damaging ritual. While a balloon launch is always intended as a lovely memorial gesture, I wish more people were aware of what danger balloons pose to wildlife and the environment. 
According to a nonprofit organization aptly called Balloons Blow, balloons are the number one marine debris risk of mortality for seabirds. Debris from balloons represents a danger because animals may become entangled in ribbons, preventing normal foraging activity. Animals also mistake balloon debris for food and ingest the material, which may block the stomach or intestines and lead to starvation. On top of this, helium is a finite resource that is essential in many areas of science and technology, including cryogenics, MRI scanners, rockets, arc welding, ventilators, lasers, solar telescopes, deep sea exploration, gas chromatography, and many others. Production of helium, which is obtained during the process of extracting natural gas from the Earth, is much slower than our current rate of consumption. And I don't know about you guys, but I tend to think allowing sick people to breathe, diagnosing illness, and dozens of other practical applications of helium should outweigh filling some single-use balloons and releasing them into the atmosphere. A much more sustainable alternative would be planting a tree, a flower garden, or a butterfly garden in remembrance. Sky lanterns, though often marketed as biodegradable or earth-friendly, are actually neither. They're nothing but flying trash and inevitably return to the earth as litter. They are made with treated paper and wires or bamboo. They've even caused huge structure fires and wildfires, caused burns to humans, and killed animals who ate them. There are plenty of other excellent ways to come together as a community to remember someone at a vigil or a rally. Blow bubbles, plant flowers or trees, get permission and paint a mural or draw one with sidewalk chalk, start a memorial fund or a foundation, do something good in your loved one's name. But don't release a bevy of balloons into the environment to kill animals and cause more unnecessary pollution. Visit balloonsblow.org for photos of how balloons can affect animals and the environment, as well as more information and sustainable alternatives to balloon launches. And please, please, please spread the word. Balloon launches are bad. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. On the evening of June 6, the I-35 bridge near McLean Stadium was lit up in blue in Frankie's honor. There's also a photo of that in the Facebook photo album for this episode. Philip Dunn, managing partner of Bubba's 33 Restaurant in Waco, offered to honor Frankie by having the restaurant assist the family with the cost of the little boy's funeral. Philip said on Facebook, We hope that through this donation, we will be a small part in creating a memorial that will honor this precious boy for many years to come. He also spoke with news station KCEN-TV. Not knowing all the details of the case, but knowing that um, those children look for us to protect them and to guide them and and to know that, um, you know, Frankie's life didn't end up that way. And we learned, um, you know, all the details of the case. And, you know, um, we struggled a little bit on on what to do. How do we help? And so uh, this is something that we landed on that we thought we could could help the family and take some of the burden off the family. We've had flower shops that would like to donate flowers. We've had families wanting to donate burial plots. Uh, we've had you know, fire departments wanting to help with, um, to escort the casket. We've had so many people reach out. Frankie was laid to rest a week after his little body was found. Visitation was held at Oak Crest Funeral Home on the evening of Monday, June 8th, including prayer and rosary services. In a private ceremony on the morning of Tuesday, June 9th, Frankie's family said their goodbyes to their precious little boy. St. Francis Catholic Church hosted the Mass of Christian Burial with the Rev. J. Eduardo Yazo as celebrant. Frankie's burial followed at Rosemound Cemetery in Waco. Frankie's services were private at the request of Frankie's family after they received a barrage of negative comments and even death threats in the wake of their tragedy. Evidently, some people suspected Frankie's maternal aunt, Alicia, was stealing money raised to benefit Frankie's father, Lorenzo. Alicia and Lorenzo did a Facebook Live interview together to dispel the rumors, but the video is no longer available. They assured the public that any funds received in memory of Frankie were being given directly to Lorenzo and that they were not, in fact, soliciting any donations. The family also expressed its gratitude for the support of the Waco community, and issued a special message of appreciation to the Waco Police Department for the care and concern the department showed the family during and after the search for Frankie. The message extended as well to the Downsville Volunteer Fire Department, to Wolf Florist and Reed's Flower for donating floral arrangements, and to Rudy Cantu for the artwork he created on Frankie's casket. Via the Waco Tribune Herald, the family said, Blessings and goodwill to all. Frankie's siblings and cousins have spoken numerous times to reporters. See everybody come together as one and support our our family member is just it means a lot. They showed a lot of love, so 
it means it means a lot to me, a lot, a lot. Even if they were mad at him, he would always find a way to make us laugh. Like he was always outgoing. He he was a little kid, always outgoing, always had a smile on his face. At night, people were coming with their boats, helping. I mean, even after police stopped the search, we were all in a, a we had family in the water searching, friends, the community. So he will forever be, be Waco's baby, forever. Still, the investigation continued. Search warrants were released, indicating police searched Laura's red 2005 Kia Spectra 5 for evidence, adding that Laura admitted in a written confession that she caused injury to the victim, which may have led to his death, and that investigators believe, after a forensic examination of the vehicle, that this vehicle was used to transport the corpse of the victim. Crime scene technicians swabbed the car for evidence, taking samples of the floorboard carpet, a blood swab from the front driver's side mirror, as well as a diaper bag, a shirt, a pillowcase, a purple fitted sheet, four blankets, black trash bags, two bottles of bleach, and laundry scent booster. Then news came out about more of Laura's past legal problems and CPS involvement in her family. Laura Sanchez's parental rights were terminated in 2015 in regard to six other children due to her prolonged drug addiction and allegations of neglect, which was confirmed on Friday, June 5th by Waco lawyer Gerald Villarreal who represented the interests of the six children during court proceedings to terminate Laura's parental rights. A lot of uh, drug abuse uh, in that case, uh, neglect in that case. She she not only lost custody, she was terminated. Her parental rights were terminated. And that's because of uh, the main part of it was the neglect and drug abuse. Uh, She was doing a lot of drugs during that time period and couldn't stop. The older child of this particular sibling group that, that I worked on that case also. She didn't have custody of that child. The dad had custody of that child. She had supervised visitation pursuant to that court order. The presumption is that a parent needs to have their child. A child should be with their parent. But but sometimes the parents just cannot meet the basic elements or the basic things that every parent does to, to be able to keep their child. It's a tragedy. And any time you work with kids like this, I mean, this is what you're trying to avoid. State child welfare caseworkers opened another investigation of Laura in 2017 when hospital tests revealed the presence of drugs in her system while pregnant with her now three-year-old daughter. Her youngest child was born in January of 2020, also with drugs in her system. At that time, Laura was on parole from state prison. Laura's mother, Caroline Medina, told KWTX News 10 that she had disowned her daughter, refused to visit her, and was in fact furious with her. I do not want to see her at all. And they would have to have to pull me out of that jail because I would go crazy. <laughs> I went crazy when I found out that I that the little girl, that little boy, my my grandson, that he that she put him in the in the trash can. And I cried. I cried. I broke down. I might have had her, but she's not no part of me no more. When asked about the last time she saw Frankie and why her daughter may have done what she did, Caroline said, "And when she came back over here, she didn't have Frankie. She said she left him with the friend." I'm going to be honest with you. I think she did that out of jealousy. Out of jealousy. Frankie's just not my grandchild. Frankie's everybody's baby now. I found this next part interesting, although whether or not it's relevant is debatable. Caroline Medina, Laura's mother, who was born on April 3, 1966, is a registered lifetime sex offender in Texas. Evidently, in August of 1997, she was convicted of aggravated sexual assault of a child and indecent sexual contact with a child, and sentenced to 10 years in prison. The victim in that case was an unidentified 7-year-old boy. For these offenses, Caroline, who is classified as having a low risk of reoffending, must check in quarterly with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Like I said, Caroline's history may not be relevant, but it certainly is interesting. This story just keeps getting sadder and sadder. Late on Wednesday, June 17th, Frankie's grieving father, 28-year-old Lorenzo Gonzalez, was arrested in connection with the death of his son and booked into the McLennan County Jail. Lorenzo was arrested on a second-degree felony charge of abandoning or endangering a child after leaving Frankie and his sisters with their mother. After investigators discovered, he knowingly signed an agreement with CPS stating he would not leave his children alone with Laura due to the risk of harm to the children. According to police, Lorenzo intentionally left the children alone and unsupervised with Laura in violation of the agreement that was made with the state. 
This violation ultimately led to the injuries and death of Frankie Gonzalez. The agreement with CPS stipulated that due to Laura's ongoing drug use, she was required to be supervised at all times while her three youngest children, including Frankie, were with her. Because Lorenzo is being held on an immigration detainer, even if he bonds out of jail, he will be held an additional 48 hours for federal immigration agents to decide whether or not to take him into custody for deportation purposes. Lorenzo is originally from Guanajuato City, Mexico. Because Frankie's autopsy report has not yet been released, Frankie's cause and manner of death have not yet been announced. For this reason, Laura has been held only on a first-degree felony charge of injury to a child, as well as her parole violation. I'm sure we will see further charges once the autopsy report is returned. In fact, a grand jury will likely be convened after the autopsy results come back to decide exactly what charges Laura will receive. During a forensic interview on June 1st, Frankie's three-year-old sister gave her account of what was likely Frankie's death. According to a CPS affidavit, the little girl stated that her brother Frankie fell in a pool and hurt his arm and closed his eyes and didn't open them back up. CPS caseworkers are required to visit with families under their supervision at least once per month, but more frequent visits can be made if warranted. There's no indication of whether or not these guidelines were being followed in Frankie's case. CPS is seeking to terminate Laura's parental rights to Frankie's sisters, who are respectively three years old and six months old. They would be the seventh and eighth of Laura's children permanently removed from her custody. For now, after a teleconference hearing presided over by Associate Judge Nikki Munkowski, the girls will remain in state foster care. Visitation by either Laura or Lorenzo is forbidden. Lorenzo has also been ordered to take a paternity test to prove he's the father of the girls. Lorenzo, who was previously tested negative for drugs, has been ordered to undergo random drug testing if he's released from jail. And if Laura is released, she must be regularly tested. I highly doubt either of them will get out anytime soon with Lorenzo on an immigration hold and Laura held without bail for her parole violation. The Waco Tribune Herald obtained sealed court records regarding CPS efforts to remove Laura's daughters from the home. The records show that at the time of his son's death, Lorenzo had primary legal custody of Frankie and his two sisters. Frankie's three-year-old sister was placed in her father's custody after she was born in February of 2017 with opioids in her system. Laura was pregnant with Frankie in December of 2017 when she was sent to prison for violating her probation on her burglary conviction. After Frankie was born in January of 2018, he was also placed into Lorenzo's custody. Laura was most recently paroled on May 9th of last year. In January of 2020, when her youngest daughter was born, the baby was also placed with Lorenzo. That baby was also born with opioids in her system, and Laura tested positive for drugs while pregnant with her. A CPS hearing in April granted Laura only supervised visits with her three youngest children, who remained in Lorenzo's custody. Lorenzo told a CPS investigator that he and Laura had recently reconciled because he thought she had kicked the drug habit and improved herself. According to him, he left the kids with Laura, thinking the CPS-approved supervisor was supposed to come to the home so Laura was not alone with them. On June 17th, prior to his arrest, Lorenzo participated in an interview. In Spanish, he said that at the time of Frankie's death, he and Laura were living together with the children. While he went to work, he said, he left the kids with Laura because he trusted her. He told the interview that on May 28th, Laura told him Frankie went to stay with her son in nearby Colleen, which turned out to be a lie. Lorenzo said he still did not know how his son died. The tears in Lorenzo's eyes in his mugshot utterly broke my heart, and I truly feel for him. But at the same time, it was his lawful and moral responsibility to protect his children. Who else, if not those closest to them, can be expected to do it? CPS and the court system told him not to leave his children alone with Laura. He had to sign a legal agreement saying so. I understand the man is grieving the loss of his son, but as much as it physically pains me to say this, as long as he understood the agreement he was signing, he is partially responsible for Frankie's death, and he must be held legally accountable. During the investigation, authorities learned that both of Frankie's young sisters, the infant and the three-year-old, tested positive for high levels of methamphetamine, which meant they were recently in direct contact with the drug. On June 25th, Park Lake Drive Baptist Church dedicated a beautiful concrete memorial, including benches, to little Frankie. The dumpster where his body was found has long since been removed, but people have continued to leave candles, stuffed animals, and other tokens of remembrance for Frankie in the spot where it stood. 
Now they have a permanent place to remember him. At noon on Thursday, June 25th, the church held a private dedication ceremony of the memorial, along with members of Frankie's family. On the church's Facebook page, they announced, Phase 1 of the project is complete. A huge thank you to s and Concrete of Waco, Phipps Memorial of Waco, and Home Depot of Belmead for their donations and hard work. This space is designed to be a place of reflection and prayer. The church added that out of respect for the space, mourners should not leave candles to avoid wax spilling onto the concrete. Instead, they asked that stuffed animal donations be made in memory of Frankie to Casa of McLennan County. The church's Facebook page added, A special thanks to Deacons Chad Williams and Todd Moore for their heart and vision for this project. It's truly a reflection of our church family. Although the criminal case resulting from Frankie's death is ongoing, Frankie's story has brought the people of Waco together in a beautiful way. From the masses turning out to search, to the donations that rolled in from both individuals and local businesses, to the artwork and memorials that have been donated and erected in his memory, the community of Waco, Texas, truly has adopted Frankie Isaiah Villayon Gonzalez as everyone's baby. Rest in peace, Frankie. You will never be forgotten. That's it for this week, guys. Join me next week for another case. Please subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com where you can listen to episodes, leave a voicemail, and become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive show merch. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and Tumblr at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter at STLC Pod. I've posted a photo album for today's case on Facebook and Instagram. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. You can also read about today's case as well as many others at sufferthelittlechildrenblog.com. This podcast was written and produced by Lane. Music and sound effects for the show were created using sounds from audiojungle.com. Always remember, hug your babies a bit closer tonight. Until next week, bye guys.